Well, now on Yorkshire, we join Alistair Burnett and Julia Somerville for a specially extended News at Ten. Mrs Thatcher goes, forced out and applauded by her party. The Foreign Secretary, Mr Hurd, says he's the man now. The Chancellor, Mr Major, joins in the Stop Heseltine tactic. A last speech. I'm enjoying this. I'm enjoying this. <laughs> Mr Kinnock says no leader can save the Tories now. Good evening. Mrs Thatcher will be out of power within a week. She was persuaded today she could not win the Conservative leadership election and she dropped out. She stays Prime Minister only until the new leader's chosen, either on the second ballot, that's next Tuesday, or very possibly the third, a week today. It's now between Mr Michael Heseltine, who ran Mrs Thatcher close in the first ballot, and two Stop Heseltine candidates, the Foreign Secretary Mr Hurd and the Chancellor Mr John Major. They're talking of a friendly contest. We are not a pack of fighting ferrets, Mr Major said this evening. We've talked to 100 Conservative MPs since midday and asked whom they would support. 52 weren't decided or wouldn't say. Of the others, 29 said they intended to vote for Mr Major, 13 for Mr Heseltine, 6 for Mr Hurd. Mrs Thatcher decided to go and told her family and her closest political colleagues early this morning. Then she rang President Bush and President Gorbachev. President Bush rang back tonight saying, we love you. At nine o'clock, the cabinet met and the prime minister told them. She'd concluded, she said, that the unity of the party and the prospects of victory in a general election would be better served if she stood down. At 9.32, the press association reported Thatcher to resign. Mr Heseltine said it brings to an end a quite remarkable premiership. At 11.09, the foreign secretary, Mr Hurd, declared himself a contender for the leadership. A few minutes later, it was confirmed that the Chancellor, Mr Major's name, was in too. Nominations closed at midday. There were just the three candidates. At 20 to 1, Mrs Thatcher was at Buckingham Palace to tell the Queen of her decision. An hour and a half later, she was in the Commons to say she looked back with some pride and some satisfaction in the achievements of her 11 years in Downing Street. At Prime Minister's question time and in the debate on Labour's no confidence motion, Mrs Thatcher seemed confident, combative, in high good humour. I'm enjoying this, she said at one point. She showed no bitterness about the Conservative MPs who'd turned against her. She said the Conservatives would win the next election and that she would be available to serve Britain in the future. Early this morning in Downing Street. Outside, it could have been any morning. Inside, at half past seven, a private conversation between Mrs Thatcher and Peter Morrison, her parliamentary private secretary. I've slept on it. I'm going to resign. Overnight, we'd heard the first news of a divided cabinet, split in their advice to the prime minister, some saying stay on. Others, you should consider going. In their ones and twos, other ministers arrived for cabinet, called for nine o'clock an hour or so earlier than the regular Thursday meeting. Then suddenly at 9.35, Downing Street press officers were handing out an official announcement. Mrs Thatcher, it said, would not contest the second ballot of the leadership contest. She would resign as soon as her successor had been chosen. Cabinet over, and they'd gone on to discuss and authorise the sending of more troops to the Gulf. Ministers came out with strained faces and, for the most part, tight lips. Kenneth Baker, with Lord Mackay and Douglas Hurd, had spoken in Cabinet in praise of Mrs Thatcher's service and record. A, this is a typically brave and selfless decision by the Prime Minister. Uh, once again, Margaret Thatcher has put her country's and party's interests before personal considerations. This will allow the party to elect a new leader who will unite the party and build upon her immense successes. If I could add just a personal note, I am very saddened indeed that our greatest peacetime Prime Minister has left government. Uh, she is an outstanding leader, not only of our country and of the world, and I do not believe we will see her life again. What decided her to go, Mr Baker? What decided her to go? Mr Baker would not say, but it became clear that last night Mrs Thatcher had seen most of her cabinet one by one, 
And John Wakeham, who just yesterday was named as Mrs. Thatcher's campaign manager, talked today of those face-to-face -face meetings and her decision. The one thing that was certain is that every member of the cabinet would have voted for her in the next round. But there were differing views as to uh, uh, what her chances of uh, winning the ballot were. And she listened to them all and she decided that this was the best way forward. Was well, she told point blank that she could not hope to win? I, by some people certainly, and some people thought she could win, and some people thought it was her duty to stay on. But she listened to it all and she came finally to this conclusion. That's Who is Later, the Environment Secretary was to talk of the advice he'd given the Prime Minister. But I have to say that I think the decision which she took, immensely brave and immensely sad though it was, was the right one. Am I right in saying you would have voted for her on the first ballot but not on the second? You're right in saying that I would have voted for her on the first ballot. Uh, you would be right if you were to go on and say that I would have uh, voted for her on the second, but uh, I put my views to her uh, about uh, what I thought was likely to happen on the second ballot. Kenneth Clark, who'd also advised her to go, said she'd done the right thing. I think the, nothing so became her as the manner of her going. I think she decided that in the interests of the party, in the interests of the government, in the interests of the causes in which uh, we all in Cabinet believe, uh, she should stand down from the leadership and offer a choice to the party. As things took their course at Westminster, Michael Heseltine, whose challenge had triggered the leadership election, gave his reaction. I have uh, heard that, that uh, Mrs Thatcher has uh, resigned. May I say at once that this brings to an end a quite remarkable premiership. She has made a remarkable contribution to Britain's history and has led this country with great distinction in the 1980s. Mid-morning, back at Downing Street, everyone was pressed into service, carrying flowers, often by the armful, arriving for the Prime Minister. Then, at just after 12.30, our first sight of Mrs Thatcher. She'd been very close to tears at Cabinet, I'm told, but had recovered, indeed had visibly brightened, as she set about the work she had to do later. The questions to be answered in the House, her censure debate speech to be checked over. But just now, her meeting with the Queen ahead at Buckingham Palace. Later, with the news spreading, crowds had gathered outside the Houses of Parliament, where proceedings in the Commons were to take up Mrs Thatcher's afternoon. Slipping in just before 3.15, she was quickly spotted. A vast Tory roar went up. Members, including Michael Heseltine, stood, their arms raised, their order papers waved in greeting and support. Labour members called the Tories hypocrites. Questions began. Mr Kinnock. May I pay tribute to the Prime Minister and to her decision this morning. She showed by that that she amounts to more than those who have turned upon her in recent days. But to Mr Kinnock's request for a general election... The answer is no. No more than we had an election when Mr. Wilson changed to Mr. Callaghan. <laughs> so, was this to be an afternoon of mild barbs, of pleasant exchanges? Not for long. Will the Prime Minister indicate who she thinks should take a share in the blame for what is, after all, a Conservative mess? Yeah. Well, the Honourable Gentleman always was quite a good advocate. He could speak to any brief, and I don't believe he believed a word of that. <laughs> Early notice there that Mrs Thatcher might have given up her job, but not her gut instinct to fight her corner. Then the censure debate. Mr Kinnock began it. Who can have confidence in a government that is split from top to bottom? If they have no confidence in each other, Mr Speaker, how can the country have confidence in them? Yeah. Replying, Mrs Thatcher strongly defended her record, but what might she do now? Dennis Skinner playfully suggested running something she hates, the European Central Bank. What a good idea. <laughs> I hadn't thought of it. But if I were, there'd be no European Central Bank accountable to no one, least of all to national parliaments. Yeah, yeah. Because the point of that kind of European Central Bank is no democracy, taking powers away from every single parliament and being able to have a single currency and a monetary policy and an interest rate which takes all political power away from us. As my right honourable friend said in his first speech, after the proposal of a single currency, a single currency is about the politics of Europe. It is about a federal Europe by the back door. So I'll consider the Honourable Gentleman's proposal. Now, where were we? I'm enjoying this. 
Later, many MPs of all parties were expressing astonishment that on a day like this, Mrs Thatcher could still turn in that sort of performance in the House of Commons. Over the 11 and a half years of her premiership, of course, that's so often been her style. Some Tories would say that it's because she so often talked like that about Europe that she's got, ultimately, into so much trouble. But not even they would deny that if that was her swan song, it was quite a performance. Michael Brunson, News at 10. Westminster. Round two of this contest is in truth all about stopping Michael Heseltine from becoming leader. The last word from Mrs Thatcher to her cabinet colleagues like Mr Hurd today was that they should ensure it was a cabinet member who succeeded her. And in the second ballot, he and Mr Major, returning to number 11 tonight, are clearly working to achieve just that. The two camps work together. The Major camp praises Mr Hurd then backbenchers must feel that they have a wide opportunity to choose amongst those uh, who could lead the party. And so both of them feel, as friends, I mean, we're all friends, it's a very, very united cabinet. As friends, they felt that they ought to stand, and uh, the party will decide. And the herd camp praises Mr Major. I think that the uh, particular experience that Douglas has is probably the decisive factor. I think Douglas is more likely to be able to deal with some of the great international problems as well as domestic issues. But saying that, I mean no criticism of John Major's considerable qualities and abilities. He's an extremely nice man and not supporting him is a very difficult decision for people like me to take. The cabinet seems to be lining up behind the two, with Douglas Hurd attracting the support of five cabinet ministers, including Messrs King, Clark and Patton, and John Major the backing of four, including his colleague Norman Lamont. No cabinet members yet declared allegiance to Michael Heseltine, although, as his camp points out, that leaves many undeclared. His chief aide, Michael Mates, knows he has votes in the bag, believes there are more on the way, but the road ahead is full of hazards. They have captured at least one senior party figure. The reason why I'm supporting him is I genuinely believe that he not only will win the leadership contest, but he will also win the country and win the next general election for the Conservative Party. This is the way the Hearn and Major camps hope the voting will work out. At the second ballot, the winner will need a simple majority of 187 votes. With three candidates, it's unlikely anyone will get that. For example, in this imaginary case, Mr. Heseltine might get 140, Mr. Hurd 122, and Mr. Major say 110. No one wins, so it goes to a third round, run on the single transferable vote system. MPs have to mark their first and second choice. In this imaginary example, if voting is the same, what happens then is whoever comes last is eliminated. In this case, John Major, and his votes are transferred to that candidate supporter's second choice, most likely to be Mr Hurd. That would make Mr Hurd the clear winner of the contest. That's just an imaginary situation, of course. If Mr Major were to come second, then the opposite could happen. He could pick up Mr Hurd's votes. And indeed, the evidence from Westminster tonight is that the Major camp is doing very well. There's been a meeting, for instance, of a group of 40 Conservative right-wingers, and they apparently broke very heavily in favour of Mr Major. Peter Allen, News at 10, Westminster. Mrs Thatcher was told regularly today by Conservative MPs she was our greatest peacetime Prime Minister. Many talked of their sadness at her going, some of their disgust at the manoeuvring inside the party which had forced her out. Some Tory backbenchers were so distressed at what had happened, they were in tears in the House of Commons. Others were appalled at the manner of Mrs Thatcher's departure, feeling that she had been shabbily treated. I feel very sad and dispirited today because I think back in the constituencies, people who have been helping the party day and night to fight for what they thought was a crusade will not only feel let down, I think we'll be disgusted at the way in which Mrs Thatcher has been attacked in this way after so many years of great government and clear government. She was one of the greatest prime ministers that we've ever had, ranking with people like Pitt and Churchill. And therefore, for many of us, it is a great tragedy. I think it's also a tragedy for the country. Who have got rid of her at this time, when the world is in such a critical situation, I believe is a catastrophe and a tragedy for this country, and we will rue the day. But others were clearly relieved that, however unpleasant the deed, it was vital for the party's future. The party has got what it wanted, which is to make a choice based on who will unify the party most, and, of course, who will deliver and put over the policies of the party uh, and develop possibly new policies in the most dynamic and effective way. 
We are all, in fact, entitled to our point of view, and if we feel that the leader should be changed, we go about and do it properly. Political opponents' reactions were mixed. I regard her period of office to be an infamous chapter in British political history, and I have wanted for just about every day that she has been in the office of Prime Minister, uh, her departure. A small tinge of sadness at the end of a, an era, the era of Thatcherism. She has been a remarkable Prime Minister. I've said so publicly and I repeat it now. She'll probably go down in terms of her skills and abilities, not her politics, which I've always opposed, as one of the great Prime Ministers of this century. But as MPs left tonight, the public outside Parliament showed, love her or hate her, they won't forget her. Mark Webster, News at 10, Westminster. Mr Major says his support is growing fast from a standing start. Tonight, he told Jon Snow on ITN's Channel 4 News he had a very realistic chance of winning. Those people who have uh, indicated their support to me come from all strands of the party, all backgrounds in the party, both experienced and inexperienced, and those who fall in the middle. It is a very wide strand indeed, and we hope it will appeal. Has it all come a bit earlier than you'd have wished? Well, these things never come precisely when you expect them, but there you are, you must take events as they are and deal with them. Uh, Mr Heseltine was very quick to produce, in essence, a manifesto, the core of which was a thorough review of the poll tax. Where are you on the poll tax? <laughs> I will be dealing with all these things over the period of the next few days, but I will deal with them in my own time and my own way so that people are perfectly clear what my policies are. Were you one of those who advised the Prime Minister that perhaps it probably was best if she didn't enter the second round? I had, in fact, signed the Prime Minister's nomination form as the candidate for the second round. Uh, I think it, the Prime Minister has been a very remarkable Prime Minister. If the Prime Minister had decided she wished to go on, then she would have had my full support in doing so. Do you think that you would handle Europe in any different way from the way in which she has? Insofar as whether we can negotiate our way to a satisfactory conclusion with our European partners, yes. I don't have a shred of doubt that we will be able to negotiate an agreement with our European partners that is satisfactory to our colleagues in the House of Commons and the country. And that latter point is immensely important. What finally, Mr Major, do you credit your meteoric rise to this position to? I uh, don't think I'm the best person to make that judgment. I do believe that if one works hard and pursues what one wants, then sometimes one is successful. And your mood tonight in terms of the realistic chances of winning? Oh, I think there's a very realistic chance of winning. Uh, we have had a very considerable amount of support for a candidacy that was not uh, preordained, not pre-announced, uh, pre and that has only become known to my parliamentary colleagues over the period of the last, of the last few hours. So we are very encouraged indeed by the tremendous amount of support we've had from all strands of the party over the period of the last few hours. Now, the other newcomer to the election, Mr Douglas Hurd, who's at Westminster. Mr Hurd, do you not fear the fate of Mr. then now Lord Whitelaw, who also came late into a leadership contest against Mrs. Thatcher? Well, both John Major and I have come late. We had, uh, I certainly, we had no organization, no planning. Uh, we've had to move very fast. I think that the labels of left, right, and center are rather meaningless uh, in this particular contest. I certainly find that the support which has come streaming in today has come from. Uh, all parts of the party and <laughs> going into a room of my supporters uh, this morning and coming together for the first time I was frankly surprised to see some people there well that's very heartening it means we're getting away from the labels you've been loyal to Mrs Thatcher are you in any sense her direct and natural political heir no I don't think there is such a thing I mean I supported her I, I signed her nomination paper too um, last night in the belief that she was actually going to go ahead um, but now the, the scene has changed, sadly, but the scene has changed. And now people have to decide who is best qualified to unify the party, to keep the country and the government steady during the, the, the testing months that certainly lie ahead, uh, and to prepare us to win the election. One thing is for sure, we won't win the election unless we can get rid of these divisions. Would you join in a television debate with Mr. Heseltine and Mr. Major on these issues? <laughs> If that seems sensible, I'm not sure it really is. I think you really get more out of us if you grill us uh, face to face. Your arrangement with Mr. Major is effectively that whichever of you is weaker then drops out. Is that right? Well, I think it may go to a third ballot, but uh, John Major and I have worked very closely for a year now, very closely, and we will certainly go on doing so, I think, in the future. 
whatever happens in this election. What we are offering to Conservative members of Parliament is a friendly contest between us. We're different people, we've got different backgrounds, there are different problems facing the country. I believe, I wouldn't have put myself forward otherwise, I believe that I am well qualified to do the immediate job of healing the wounds before they go poisonous, pulling the party together, getting the government on the road again, following the policies on which we're agreed. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Thank you. In the Saudi desert for Thanksgiving Day, President Bush says of Mrs. Thatcher she was a good Prime Minister, a good friend of America's, and I'll miss her. A report next. Plus, the balance sheet of 11 years in Downing Street. That's in a couple of minutes. Some modern technology can be mm. sort of confusing. Right, this is a wobble wheel. Everyone on the floor. <laughs> but not the Sony TR75 with stereo sound. Fill this bed. It's so small. Give it to me. That's it. So light. Push it through. And so easy to operate, you'll find it hard to resist using it. <laughs> Wherever you are. Ah. Oh. Amazingly, you can also plug it directly into your TV so you can enjoy instant playback with your friends. Sony, why compromise? Exotic preparations for hair, skin and body. Boots Natural Collection. Braun's new Silk Appeal gives you silky smooth legs for weeks. Silk Appeal's rotating discs open and close to act like tweezers, removing even very short hairs. Experience wonderfully smooth legs with the new Braun Silk Appeal. How can we be sure this room is at the right temperature? He's happy. If he was cold, his fur would stand up to trap warm air. He'd shiver. He'd hug himself to keep warm. She's not saying much. If her fur is standing up, it's hard to see. She's too young to sweat or shiver. The only way to tell is to touch her. She's fine. Hardly surprising. British Gas Central Heating is one of the most controllable systems known to man or beast. Gas, the heat of the moment.